Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk, uh, which is entitled Public Funding, Private Profits, Public Health and the Case for Medicare for All. My name is Kenyon Farrow, and I'm the Managing Director of Advocacy and Organizing with a national organization called Prep for All, uh, whose work is really dedicated to uh, making sure that um, everyone in the United States has access to uh, life-saving preventative medication, um, in this case, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, for uh, as low cost or free uh, as possible with all of the uh, connected services uh, that folks may need. Um, we also do some work around COVID-19 uh, vaccine access globally. Uh, as in the last two years, we've seen great disparities in uh, the countries uh, who have access to the COVID-19 vaccines, especially the mRNA vaccines, and the countries who don't. Um, so we stepped into that space as well. But for the purposes of this conversation, uh, I will be talking uh, about uh, PrEP uh, more specifically. So. Uh, to talk uh, a little bit more about the sort of situation that we're in in the United States with, with HIV. Um, so in, uh, a few years ago, uh, the uh, former presidential administration uh, announced a plan to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. I have been a part of several efforts, uh, first in New York State to create the first state plan to end the HIV epidemic. Uh, and then working with several other jurisdictions who were looking to build plans. And ultimately the uh, former president's administration uh, took that up and created the context for a, a sort of a national strategy to end the HIV epidemic. Um, and so part of that initiative um, created uh, funding for uh, 48 uh, counties in the United States, uh, Washington, DC, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and then several states. Um, which uh, those seven uh, states, which you can see on this map kind of uh, highlighted in the sort of white um, uh, barrier, uh, those, uh, these different jurisdictions make up 50% uh, of HIV diagnoses in the United States. So 48 counties, DC, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, seven states uh, make up 50% of HIV diagnoses in the United States. So that's where uh, the former administration decided to sort of focus these resources in order to create better systems for people uh, living with HIV or at risk for HIV and uh, to invest some resources also in um, PrEP access, right? So I'll talk a little bit for a second for people who are unfamiliar what PrEP is. PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And it is a strategy to prevent HIV. So it starts with um, 10 years ago, a drug was approved uh, to uh, prevent uh, HIV. The first drug uh, taken, one, one pill taken every day, was shown to uh, be more effective at uh, reducing uh, HIV uh, rates or risk of HIV than even condom usage. Um, and so that has been in place for 10 years, and yet we still have really terrible access, uh, and most people don't even know that PrEP exists in the United States uh, in order for us to take uh, more of a benefit uh, from it. And I'll get into some of the reasons for that a, a little bit later. So um, one of the other sort of dynamics here, so you can see kind of in this uh, first uh, map on the left that, uh, again, 48% of the counties targeted by this in the HIV epidemic plan um, are in the South because those are some of the highest burden counties uh, in the United States. And I believe that 40, it's 44, 45% of all people living with HIV or diagnosed with HIV in the United States live uh, primarily in the Southern states. Um, so we see great uh, disparities there. Um, so in addition to PrEP, um, one of the other things that we know um, from research, uh, which I'll point to a little bit later, is that for people living with HIV, um, if people who are diagnosed with HIV uh, start treatment for HIV using antiretroviral medication and they get to what we call viral suppression or being quote unquote undetectable, that those folks have no risk of transmitting the virus even if they have sex without condoms or other kind of barrier methods. And so it's been 
pushing over the last um, probably seven or eight years on the treatment side to really scale up access to HIV treatment for people living with HIV and to also help people get into care faster um, so that um, people, one, have healthier outcomes and we have fewer deaths from HIV in the United States and fewer other sort of comorbidities, but that also um, people cannot transmit the virus. So in one way, getting people access to HIV treatment in and of itself becomes a prevention strategy paired with people who are not living with HIV but may be at higher risk for HIV uh, have access to PrEP as uh, part of the strategies to um, help eliminate uh, or certainly reduce HIV from epidemic status in the United States across all communities. So that's another reason on the map on the right, we're looking at viral suppression rates uh, across the state and which states get to uh, higher viral suppression rates within six months of a diagnosis, which tells us whether or not people were actually um, starting treatment uh, as soon as possible after they're diagnosed. Um, and as you can see, uh, you see where the disparities lie in people starting treatment faster. So in the lighter blue states, uh, you can tell that people are, are not starting treatment uh, within six months of their diagnosis, even though we know from the signs that it's actually better for people to people's health to start treatment sooner and is also better for uh, prevention of, of transmission of HIV. So um, one of the uh, dynamics, uh, obviously, in, in both access to, to PrEP as a prevention strategy and also to uh, treatment of HIV is insurance status. And so we see, again, higher rates of HIV, as I showed you in the other slides, in the southern states or states that, which are a lot of the states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so here you can see the sort of uninsured rates uh, you know, by states uh, and on the right, and then also the states that haven't expanded Medicaid. And there is mounting evidence um, from different studies that the states that are expanding Medicaid or that have expanded Medicaid, one, certainly drop their uninsured rates, but also that just expanding Medicaid in and of itself has reduced HIV uh, transmissions in those places that have uh, expanded Medicaid, including in a Southern state, Louisiana. Um, so, uh, and which has been a state that has been one of the highest burden states uh, in the country for many, many years. So again, the HIV epidemic is disproportionately con concentrated in non-Medicaid expansion states. New diagnoses of HIV is 65% higher in non-Medicaid expansion states. Um, and the new diagnoses rate dropped by 29% in Medicaid expansion states compared to 9% in non-Medicaid expansion states, more than a threefold difference. So that tells you something about just having health coverage, uh, what it actually means in terms of, of reducing uh, transmission of HIV. We also see uh, changes in racial disparities in HIV diagnoses. So we see certainly still disproportionate rates of HIV among uh, Black and uh, Latinx uh, communities in both non-expansion and in expansion states. But we do see certainly among um, Black folks a reduction in HIV uh, in the states where Medicaid was expanded. And so we're beginning to see some of those gaps in racial disparities close uh, just by uh, Medicaid expansion. Um, just showing you where some of the rates of HIV among both racial and uh, uh, sexual identity, sexual orientation exists. And so uh, Black or African-American uh, gay and bisexual men highest rates of HIV followed very closely, in fact, by uh, Latinx uh, folks, uh, gay and bisexual men uh, with HIV um, in the United States. Um, highest risk uh, among uh, Black trans folks in the United States. Uh, and overall uh, studies, I think, show us that of about 44% of all transgender women in the United States are living with HIV. Uh, and when you look again at race within trans communities, you see disproportionate rates of HIV among both transgender men and transgender women who are black. So as I pointed out earlier, when we look at some of the research studies that, um, that have pointed us to uh, ways in which we can greatly reduce HIV, 
Um, we've not really seen the benefit of those based on the public health and healthcare infrastructure that we currently have. So uh, if you look on the left, it's HPTN 052. So that was a HIV prevention trials network study um, that uh, demonstrated uh, that viral suppression for people who are living with HIV. So people starting treatment and getting their uh, viral load under control uh, means that they cannot transmit the virus to other people, right, uh, through sexual contact. And so that study happened, um, you know, in 20, roughly 2011, 2012, the FDA approves PrEP, so a one pill a day uh, treatment uh, or prevention uh, for HIV was approved in 2012. And then we learned a few years later in 2015 that for people living with HIV, if they start treatment as soon as possible, they have better lifelong health outcomes and actually uh, also can, you know, reduce transmission of the virus uh, because we know uh, once people get virally suppressed, they can't transmit. And so those two things alone, we know that treatment works for prevention. And we also know that uh, taking a pill a day for people who uh, are at risk for HIV also reduces uh, transmission. We should have seen a great reduction in uh, HIV rates in this country by that point. But if you look at the sort of top line, the uh, dark blue line uh, overall, we have not seen great reductions in HIV in those years where we had those great scientific discoveries about what would prevent HIV. And then if you look at the subsequent lines, which really break down uh, the diagnoses rates among uh, different racial groups, that uh, those numbers have been mostly reduced in uh, white uh, populations, but have uh, kind of stalled among uh, Black African Americans. And are, we're actually seeing increases uh, in uh, Hispanic and uh, Latinx folks. So it is, shouldn't be surprising um, based on, uh, again, the Medicaid expansion and some of the other issues in terms of racial disparities in coverage in the United States that we see disparities in uh, who has access to PrEP in the United States. So while 25% of people eligible for PrEP were prescribed PrEP in 2020, which is a very low number uh, in and of itself, but we see that that coverage is not equal and only 9% of Black folks and only 16% of Latinx folks who would be eligible uh, for PrEP were prescribed PrEP uh, in 2020. So again, PrEP use remains underutilized um, despite its uh, approval in 2012. Um, there's been slow uptake and scale up of access. It took the federal agencies a long time to roll out different things to help us scale up PrEP. So it was almost two years before the FDA um, uh, issued uh, guidance, um, or, or guidance was issued, I should say, um, by CDC, actually. Um, and then it took uh, four years to begin tracking PrEP utilization and another eight years to begin dealing with some of the financial barriers that were, uh, you know, existing um, that prevented people from uh, staying on PrEP where they interested or started. There are currently no federal programs that cover the continuum of, of PrEP care for uninsured individuals. Um, and until very recently, based on some advocacy that Prep for All and some other organizations did, we were able to get the CDC to actually change its grant structure so that grantees of the CDC, so whether states or counties or community-based organizations, could use a percentage of those funds to cover the cost of both medication and also lab services uh, for Prep. Um, and then also we have a system where um, fairly qualified health centers and uh, community-based uh, aid service organizations are often incentivized to keep prescribing brand name drugs. And I should say too, that the first drug approved for PrEP uh, in 2012 went generic two years ago. And so the cost differential between those two drugs, um, and then a, a, another drug was, was approved a few years ago, um, 2018, 
um, by the same company, by Gilead Sciences. So the brand name drugs at this point are about $1,800 a month for a 30-day supply. And the generic drug is available for about $30 for a 30-day supply. So actually being able to roll out the generic drug makes a huge difference in terms of cost savings for uh, federal government, uh, public health programs, and for uh, health centers that may be using uh, PrEP. But some of those health centers have a kind of perverse incentive to keep prescribing the brand name higher cost drugs based on how we sort of construct our kind of health system in the United States in ways that is uh, problematic. So one of the issues with our sort of systems is uh, what we call the 340B program, which is a federal program uh, that uh, essentially provides uh, kind of cash rebates to uh, healthcare institutions that are serving quote unquote underserved communities. Um, and so those fairly qualified health centers um, often have pharmacies attached to them um, in order to, uh, you know, one, it just makes it easier, obviously, to sort of dispense medications to patients, especially if you are in poor communities, um, not having people be sent to, you know, pharmacies across the city, et cetera. So it can be convenient for that reason, but also those uh, institutions, if they prescribe those kind of high cost drugs, there is a kind of rebate that comes back to them for prescribing them that the government sort of, you know, helps um, pay for. And so you see this sort of describing this system where, you know, the manufacturer provides a 340B sort of hospital or clinic with the discounted drug. Then you have uh, the hospital or clinic provides the medicines to patients, including those with commercial insurance. Um, and then you see the sort of cost differential. So for every $100 uh, reimbursement for, for drug from a commercial insurer, um, three, $60 of that uh, purchase price uh, is from the drug manufacturer, uh, $10 copay from the patient. And so there's a $50 profit um, for the 340B hospital or, or clinic. So you see in that we have a kind of you know, perverse incentive to prescribe high cost drugs because those entities, once they get those profits back, they can use those resources for, you know, whatever they want. And sometimes they're using them to cover the other expenses of care for individuals that's uncompensated, but it also then keeps an incentive for them to continue to spend uh, money on high cost drugs, even sometimes when there are generic options available, which is how uh, it, it, what has happened in terms of, of, of PrEP in the United States. Um, one of the sort of, you know, uh, differences is that, you know, the kind of rules are written so that, you know, it prevents uh, 340B, uh, it prevents Medicaid programs from kind of double dipping from getting a discount through the 340B and the Medicaid uh, drug rebate program. But then there's like a kind of a loophole for fairly qualified health centers to access drugs through the 340B program and dispense those drugs to Medicaid patients. Um, and that carve out pro, um, prohibits uh, FQHCs from dispensing 340B drugs to Medicaid patients um, specifically. Um, so what happened in the last year? So um, Gilead Sciences, who is the has the market share on HIV uh, treatment drugs in the United States and uh, two of the three drugs that are approved for PrEP, right? Um, other than the, the generic. Um, so they made some changes to a, a patient assistance program called Advanced Access, which would allow patients to choose uh, their prescriptions field either by a mail order pharmacy or real retail pharmacy. And then those um, clinics or, or health providers, those covered entities, could only be reimbursed for amount paid for each bottle plus a dispensing fee and administrative fee. And one of the challenges that new model kind of ensures dispensing free medicine to eligible 
participants um, to continue, but at no uh, cost to the pharmacy and compensates uh, the pharmacies for dispensing the medication, which then takes resources out of those, um, those clinics or hospitals that are providing that care to individuals. And so there was a lot of pushback um, from, uh, you know, many community organizations on this program, uh, and they pushed it back from like an October start date to a January date. And we're just beginning to see kind of what the impact of that is now that um, those uh, fairly qualified health centers can no longer um, kind of reap the benefits directly from the 340B revenue um, from prescribing and what will happen to that system of care. Um, so some of the problems with the way this system works, and I will get to the Medicare piece in, in, in a second, or Medicare for all piece. But one is that the, you know, it's, it's a tiny program that the value of outpatient program discounts is only $6 billion or 1.9% of drug manufacturers revenue. It perversely incentivizes the use of more expensive drugs, as I named. Uh, and it's very inefficient, right, that for every dollar increase in 340B revenue that we as a uh, society are sort of public money, uh, we need to spend $2 to $50 more, most of it going to the drug manufacturers and pharmacy benefit managers. So it's a very complicated system I'm trying to make it explain it in simple terms, but um, but there's a perverse kind of incentive for clinics to prescribe high cost drugs um you know to patients even if generics are available because it's a higher sort of you know rebate or kickback for them um so what is that crisis causing right now um the gilead drugs for hiv um make up 57 percent of all antiretroviral use in the united states right it's a huge piece of of the puzzle um all medical providers that provide hiv medical care medical care are going to lose revenue many organizations that use those 340b or gilead's advanced access program to pay for uninsured you know uh pay for the uninsured uh supportive services etc and this is particularly problematic for organizations in the non-medicaid expansion states who have higher rates of uninsured people and more uncompensated care especially for prep services um, and so they may shut those programs down that are providing care to the uninsured in those states um, and again the the sort of pipeline for new hiv drugs is drying up and we're moving more to more research towards long acting products, right? So we've one, one drug approved for the treatment of HIV, which is a shot every other month, and another one approved for PrEP recently uh, for prevention, one shot every other month. And so those things actually reduce the overall kind of expenditure, right? Or, or what the, the sort of cost of care eventually that will um, be problematic again for those community-based organizations relying on the 340B revenue, um, you know, et cetera. Um, so just some long-term solutions, right, to this, this problem. One of the things that we've been doing at Prep for All is trying to talk to folks in our, in the sort of HIV advocacy community that this system of using high cost HIV drugs, either for prevention or treatment is really unsustainable. And so we really actually need a system to overhaul how we do prevention and treatment for HIV in the United States that doesn't rely on, um, on high drug costs and 340B kickbacks in order to bolster those kind of community-based services that a lot of those uh, health centers provide you know to people who are either uninsured or underinsured or need other kind of wraparound services in order to stay in care um already talked about SWE. now the cdc um <clears throat> recently started allowing grantees to use funds for prep services um but we really need a national program for prep and just today uh the biden administration announced in its new federal budget some funding for a national prep program and we will be doing some advocacy about making sure that, that money stays in the budget and ultimately that you know we help this sort of design what that system needs to look like for people who uh use prep uh, as i do myself um, and we also need to be prepared for a world where uh, 
HIV drugs, antiretroviral drugs um, go more generic, um, which I think is coming in the next five to 10 years. And so the, our systems will not be allowed to kind of rely on expensive brand name drugs if a vast majority of drugs are gonna go generic in the next five or 10 years and we need different finance uh, mechanisms to do so. Um, cost savings from generic drugs could be used. The government could literally capture savings like in Medicaid and Medicare and other programs that it spends on expensive drugs. Um, and now that we have a generic, use the differential between the generic drug and the, what we were paying for the more expensive drug and refunnel that money back into our public health systems um, to increase like the number of people who are using PrEP to prevent HIV and also help incentivize viral suppression among people who are living with HIV um, so that we continue to reduce uh, uh, HIV related uh, morbidities and, and, uh, and also deaths and also prevent transmission of HIV. And I think Medicare for all honestly would give us a lot of leeway in terms of what our system for HIV prevention and treatment would look like. So it would give obviously the government the power to negotiate drug costs to maximize the use of generics and to also reinvest those savings uh, into service delivery and access programs, which would do a great deal to eliminating the kind of like racial, gender, and geographic disparities that we see uh, in HIV outcomes in the United States. Thank you.